東京ライブのエンドスコピーは So, hello everyone, and welcome to our discussion. The variety is obvious, a big topic. So,、uh, I'm、uh, Haruino、uh, uh, from、uh, Showa University Koto Tars Hospital,、uh, one of the moderators. And it's my pleasure to introduce my co chair of this session. So,、uh, Professor Stefan Zivaut from、uh, Houston, Hill Surrounding Clinic of the Zuri. Thank you, Stefan. Hello. hello. <laughs> and the、uh, Um, uh, as a commentator, um, uh, we uh, uh, proudly invite the uh, um, uh, uh, Pro Professor Pratik Sharma. So, everybody knows him well, the professor of the University of Kansas and the global leader of the Variety s Office. And、uh, his uh, uh, CM classification is、uh, now the standard, leader standard、uh, proce uh, criteria procedure.、Uh, no, no. Classification of the variety s Africa's、uh, description. So uh, uh, today we have、uh, two speakers. So、uh, we would like to introduce the, I would like to introduce the first speaker. So,、uh, okay. So our first speaker is、uh, Dr.、Uh, Christopher Tessima Sensei. So、uh, he is uh, um, uh, chief of the、uh, Our therapeutic endoscopy and at the St. Michael Hospital in Toronto, Canada. And、uh, he performs a various、uh, therapeutic endoscopy, ESD, EMO, of course, LFA, and the、uh, POM and the <coughs> interventional US, and the uh, uh, enteroscopy as well, capture endoscopy. So、uh, he covers the wide area、uh, of the endoscopy. So、uh, today, so he will talk about the variety、uh, uh, surface. So,、uh, Chris, so please、uh, start your lecture. Hello, everyone. My name is Christopher Tashima, and it's been a great honor to be here to talk about variety esophagus,、uh, the current role of EMR versus ESD. It's a great honor to be able to speak. It's been a real pleasure getting to know Dr. Inoue over the past few years as he's come to our live course in, in Toronto. This is an example of a typical case we see at St. Michael's. This is a 60 year old man who underwent endoscopy to investigate a six year history of symptomatic GERD. Had a new diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus and biopsy showed high grade dysplasia. He was referred to our center and had this diagnostic endoscopy performed where we found this lesion. And so the question is whether a patient like this should have EMR or should this lesion be resected by ESD? And I'm not sure quite the answer, which is why we're presenting this today. The current standard of care、uh, is to perform multimodality treatment, which begins with endoscopic resection of any visible lesion, followed by subsequent ablation of all remaining Barrett's esophagus. And for the most part, this endoscopic resection is still performed with EMR. And this current strategy is very successful. EMR is technically successful in almost all cases. Most patients, when they have new or recurrent lesions, can be retreated with additional endoscopic therapy. Rates of long term remission of neoplasia are excellent, and complication rates are low. So, what we're doing already, the current standard of care is already working. For the Japanese audience,、uh, EMR typically now is performed with multi band mucosectomy, which I'll show just so you can see what it looks like outside of Japan. This is a patient with long s i n g a b a r r e t t e You can see an area of neosquamous from previous EMR. He's now come back for follow up endoscopy, and another lesion is seen in the distal esophagus that is suspicious for intramucosal cancer. We've marked the location of the lesion and then proceed with this、uh, cap and band approach. The tissue is suctioned up into the distal attachment cap, and a rubber band is fired to create a pseudo polyp. A snare is then used to cut beneath the band and performed a hot snare polypectomy. This is done sequentially throughout the lesion in a piecemeal fashion. Typically, we're not achieving our、uh, on block resection. This is typically piecemeal. You need to line up the edge of the cap to the edge of the resection defect to ensure that no bridges of mucosa are left in between and slowly and steadily progress through the lesion. 
The advantages of this technique is it's well established. Uh, it's easy to perform technically uh, and it's quite efficient. Average procedure times can range between 15 to 20 minutes. And ultimately, uh, if done properly, you can achieve a nice contiguous uh, resection defect as shown here, where the lesion has been completely resected. Once that's been accomplished and we have confirmed that um, nothing further needs to be done, the patient can then undergo ablation for the remaining Barrett's esophagus segment. And this can take the form of cryoablation therapy in the bottom corner or various forms of rate of frequency ablation, which can be done through the scope or over the scope uh, probes or with a circumferential balloon catheter. And this strategy of uh, multimodality therapy has been verified in multiple studies. This is the Euro 2 study that Stefan mentioned to me earlier. Um, Multi-center study with uh, patients with Barrett's esophagus with high-grade dysplasia and intramucosal cancer who underwent endoscopic resection uh, of visible lesions, typically lesions less than two centimeters, and then underwent rate of frequency ablation every three months until the Barrett's was all eradicated and then were enrolled in follow-up. And they achieved very excellent results with very high rates of complete remission of dysplasia and complete remission of intestinal metaplasia. Only 4% of patients had recurrent neoplasia, high-grade dysplasia, or cancer within two years of follow-up, but all of those patients could be successfully treated with additional endoscopic therapy. So this stepwise approach of resection followed by ablation works very, very well. So the question then becomes is, what is the role for ESD? Where does ESD fit in Barrett's esophagus? Well, there's lots of data showing that it has excellent efficacy and safety profiles. And we know that by performing ESD, we're achieving much higher rates of on-block resection, significantly increased R0 resection, and consequently decreases in local recurrence. The question is, for a disease like Barrett's esophagus, do these things change long-term clinical outcome for the patient? There are lots of studies and with varying data uh, discussing this because of time constraints. I've selected one recent publication from the United States. Uh, this is a multi center um, retrospective study involving eight centers that performed both EMR and ESD for patients with Barrett's esophagus. It had a balance of both high grade dysplasia and intramucosal cancer. So the EMR group was only 45% intramucosal cancer, the ESD group was 75% intramucosal cancer. They showed that the rates of uh, complications were not higher with ESD compared to EMR, but successful rates of on-block resection and R0 resection, of course, were substantially higher. And importantly, if you look at the EMR group, a very high percentage of patients, over 31% of patients had recurrent or residual disease. And consequently, one fourth of patients had to go second or third endoscopic resection procedures before they could be enrolled in RFA. However, so the authors take the conclusion that ESD is better because it reduces this recurrence and need for additional resections. When you actually look at the patients in the EMR group, however, all those patients could ultimately achieve complete remission of dysplasia when they underwent additional endoscopic resections and ablations. So the end result, if you look two years down the road of achieving complete remission of dysplasia, it actually ends up being the same. So from an all-patient perspective, when you're encompassing enrolling patients with high-grade dysplasia and intramucosal cancer, overall, my current take on the literature is that I don't think that the literature demonstrates an overall clinical benefit for ESD compared to the combined approach using multi-band mucosectomy followed by RFA when you look at Barrett's as a, as a general disease. However, there are different circumstances where I think ESD does make a difference. So here's an example of a patient with very long, seg long segment Barrett's esophagus with multiple areas of surface and vascular uh, irregularity consistent with intramucosal cancer. And when you see the diatheramic markings place, there's actually very little uh, areas that are non-dysplastic. A lesion like this would be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to remove by EMR. And so I think when there's extensive widespread uh, intramucosal cancer suspected, this is a very good indication for ESD um, because realistically, when you're doing near circumferential resection or circumferential resection, I think ESD is really uh, the only viable option from a technical perspective. And you can see from the final resection defect here, 
that doing this uh, with EMR would have been completely impractical, let alone successful. Another strong indication for ESD in Barrett's is when there's a bulky or sessile lesion. This patient was referred with biopsies showing intramucosal cancer. You can see the distal margin of this lesion where the cancer likely exists. But a bulky sessile lesion like this may not suck up completely into the cap. So if you're using a cap strategy and placing a snare beneath the band, it may not get deep enough to resect the entire lesion. So ESD, in this case, I used a pocket creation method, I think is a much better strategy for a sessile lesion to ensure that the resection plane is sufficiently deep within the submucosa to ensure cure. Another reason where ESD can be very useful is when there's suspicion of submucosal invasion. This patient had this irregular lesion in the distal esophagus where the surface was lost and the vas vessels were very amorphous. And we were very worried that there would be some mucosally invasive disease in this lesion. And I think when there's that clinical suspicion of some mucosal invasion, it really makes sense to do on block resection by ESD and to get a definite deep resection plane. And that's what we did in this case, uh, in this case, using uh, clip line traction to facilitate the resection. He ultimately ended up having M3 intramucosal disease um, without some mucosal invasion, but I think the lesion itself looks sufficiently irregular that this was the right decision. So when might ESD be most useful? So for the, the cases that I've illustrated, when there's widespread multifocal cancer, when there's a bulky sessile lesion uh, with intramucosal cancer, when lesions have suspicion for submucosal invasion, uh, and for the interest of time I didn't show, but when there's severely fibrotic areas, um, I think resection by ESD is going to be more likely to be successful uh, than resection by EMR. And so this is my perspective. Most of the European guidelines would suggest the reasons why we should be using or when we should choose ESD uh, over EMR. There's an interesting publication uh, recently from the, the Dutch group, which actually summarized every ESD that's been performed in Barrett's esophagus uh, in their country. There's six centers in the Netherlands that or authorized to perform ESD in Barrett's, the very strict entry criteria, the only inclusion criteria for ESD in the Netherlands is a sessile lesion or where there's suspicion of submucosal invasion. And so over the past decade, they've treated 138 patients uh, with ESD. About half of them uh, ended up being uh, T1A cancers and half ended up being T1B cancers with submucosal invasion. You can see that the success rates for R0 resection are much higher uh, for intramucosal cancer and high-grade dysplasia, that's in the bottom left, they achieved 87% R0 resection. But once there was submucosal invasion, it dropped down to 49%. So it's more difficult to have successful ESD. The interesting thing in this study is they then did a follow-up endoscopy in all patients eight to 12 weeks after the ESD and looked to see who actually had residual cancer or residual dysplasia, and then risk stratified the patients at that point going forward. What you can see here is that as the disease state becomes more advanced, the rates of R0 resection go down. So for intramucosal cancer, R0 resection is extremely high and almost no residual neoplasia at follow-up endoscopy. With SM1 cancer, R0 drops down to 58%. And with SM2 and SM3 cancer, R0 is down to 45%. And those more advanced cancers were much more likely to have residual neoplasia at the three-month endoscopy. So the interesting thing is they, they, the patients who had SM2 and SM3 cancer, they offered them esophagectomy. Some of them had esophagectomy, but many didn't. And then they followed those patients for about three years so far to see what would happen in terms of recurrence. So the patients who had R0 resection and SM1 disease had no recurrence in their three years of follow-up. And SM2 and SM3 disease only had 5% local regional recurrence. Now, again, only with three years of follow-up. So these rates are, are much lower than the traditional numbers that we would quote for patients based on a prior surgical series. And currently we recommend patients with SM2 disease, R0 resection to have esophagectomy. These data suggest perhaps there might be room to expand the criteria for resection for ESD and Barrett's. And even the, the R1 resection patients, those who, who had no residual tumor at their follow-up endoscopy three months who were then followed, the rate of recurrence in three years was only 5.6%. Uh, so perhaps 
you know, we're being too strict in, in, in sending patients to esophagectomy. And if this data can be replicated in broader data sets, we may be able to expand the criteria for ESD and be able to offer um, curative resections for more patients this way. So in conclusion, I think that EMR remains the standard of care for most patients and for most endoscopic resections in Barrett's esophagus, but that ESD has an increasing role for difficult lesions or when there's more advanced lesions with submucosal invasion. And if it's, this data can be shown that patients with SM2 or SM3 cancers and other favorable pathology can potentially avoid esophagectomy, then this will further expand the role for ESD. Thank you. So thank you so much, uh, Chris. Uh, your um, really a comprehensive and uh, um, uh, outstanding talk. And the uh, uh, we will have a discussion at the uh, uh, end of this session. So uh, Stefan, so please introduce the next speaker. It is now my great honor to introduce uh, Professor Robert Bishara. He is associate professor at Queen's University and uh, his career started in Toronto. And uh, there are two uh, major points in his curriculum. One is the clinical fellowship at Therapeutic Endoscopy St. Michael's Hospital. And the second one is that he has been more than one year together with uh, Professor Inoue at the Showa University, and he was personally educated by Professor Inoue. We are looking now very forward to his uh, presentation. And uh, the title of his presentation is now the next step in Barrett's optical diagnosis. Please, Robert. All right, thank you very much, Stefan, for a really kind introduction. Uh, and thank you, Professor Inouye, for inviting me to speak. It's, it's always a pleasure and an honor for me to, to participate in uh, these meetings. So I'm very, very thankful. And thanks, Dr. Sharma, as well. I'm really looking forward to some of your thoughts on, on this topic as well. You've been so prolific in this area. So uh, the title is The Next Step in Barrett's Optical Diagnosis. And I'll briefly just go over the uh, Barrett's and limitations of the current optical diagnosis classifications, the results of our pilot study that we recently published, and further investigation of this classification that we're getting underway hopefully shortly. So Barrett's, as we all know, is an acquired premalignant condition secondary to chronic acid reflux. The risk of progression to esophageal adenocarcinoma varies quite widely, anywhere from 0.1% uh, for non-dysplastic up to 30% for high-grade dysplasia. And it's quite common in terms of uh, patients in North America, where patients that are symptomatic due to GERD have an overall risk of about 10%. And there's universal agreement that the Seattle protocol is the optimal technique for tissue acquisition. Uh, however, despite this rigorous protocol, the miss rate can range anywhere from 10 to 50%, depending on the literature you read. And biopsy and EMR histology correlate quite poorly, only about 50% of the time. And EMR and ESD often upstage the histology 40 to 60% of the time. And this is our experience as well in our recent uh, series, where things were upstaged 59% from biopsy to ESD. So due to these shortcomings of the current surveillance technique, there's a lot of interest in uh, image-enhanced endoscopy-targeted biopsies. Uh, so the ASGE published the systematic review and meta-analysis recently uh, in terms of uh, chromo endoscopy with acetic acid, NBI, and confocal laser endomicroscopy. And these have all been shown to meet the sensitivity, specificity, and negative predictive value thresholds that are established in the PIVI document, which you can see here in red. Um, the numbers are there for acetic acid. We can see, again, meet those um, thresholds and as well as NBI. I didn't include a confocal laser endomicroscopy as it's not readily available and very practical in terms of day-to-day -day use. So in terms of the optical diagnosis classifications, uh, endoscopically Barrett's is very heterogeneous and there's no unified classification currently. And there's multiple classifications that have been proposed, a number of which uh, Dr. Sharma has uh, headed. Um, and you can see a list of some of the more pertinent ones here. All of them essentially use similar, similar principles of the VS classification uh, used for gastric cancer, which was introduced by Dr. Kenshi Yao, uh, essentially the father of magnifying endoscopy for early gastric cancer, which looks at the microsurface and the microvasculature. Uh, 
So this image uh, demonstrates uh, quite nicely in terms of how heterogeneous Barrett's is. So all these image, images are of non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. Uh, and you can see, again, the surface morphology in terms of the microsurface and the microvasculature is quite different amongst all of them. So this is one of the more recent uh, classifications, the Bing classification. And they look at the mucosal pattern and again, it's classified as regular or irregular. And specifically, they talk about circular, ridged, villous, tubular patterns. Uh, and again, in terms of the irregular, they talk about uh, irregular microsurface uh, 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 patterns. The vascular pattern, similarly, regular or irregular. Based on the classification, you have two predicted pathologies, either non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus or high-grade uh, or esophageal adenocarcinoma. And the overall accuracy of this classification is about 85%. And this used uh, NBI uh, via the Olympus platform. Uh, another classification uh, from the Japanese Society of Gastroenterology, also using NBI, classified things similarly in terms of uh, the mucosal surface and the vascular pattern. And again, the predicted pathology was non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus or low-grade, high-grade esophageal adenocarcinoma. And again, the accuracy was quite good, overall at 95%. Similarly, this was a classification using the Pentax platform, using optical enhancement and eye scan. Uh, the mucosal pattern and vascular pattern are similarly classified. And again, the predicted pathology was dichotomous in terms of non-dysplastic or low-grade, high-grade esophageal adenocarcinoma with an accuracy of about 83%. And this is the final one, and this one used uh, blue light imaging from the Fujifilm platform. Similarly, they had the mucosal pattern and vascular pattern, but they introduced uh, color, and specifically, the presence of focal darkness was associated with neoplasia. And again, the predictive pathology was dichotomous in terms of non-dysplastic or high-grade intramucosal submucosally invasive carcinoma with an overall accuracy of 95%. So in terms of the limitations of the current classifications, we can see that part of it is that they're dichotomous in terms of it's broken down into non-dysplastic and everything else. And the low-grade dysplasia category is not included as a distinct category in these classifications. And there's pretty sparse data on real-time application of these um, prospectively. So the spectrum of pathology is, is quite variable as we know. It goes from non-dysplastic to inflammatory, indefinite, low-grade, high-grade intramucosal SM1 and deeply invasive carcinoma. And these can be grouped clinically in terms of these categories. So non-dysplastic will resume normal surveillance. Indefinite or low-grade will repeat endoscopy generally in short interval, about six months, ensure optimized acid suppression, and then pending that pathology, the appropriate arrangements are made subsequently. And then for predicted high-grade intramucosal SM1, we resect. And for massively invasive uh, surgical referral for oncologic resection or definitive chemoradiation. So this is our pilot study that we enrolled 22 patients in, and we took 66 targeted biopsies with magnification, um, and the images uh, were captured and then analyzed retrospectively to create a classification um, and validated uh, against the pathology. So in terms of the uh, results, you can see here in terms of the non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, about 50 of the targeted biopsies were non-dysplastic, uh, 10 were low-grade or indefinite, and uh, six were high-grade uh, or the high-grade intramucosal SM1 category. So based on the, the findings, we created three classes. So class A uh, was non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, which you can see up here. So you have a no microvascular irregularity, no microsurface irregularity, and no demarcation line. Whereas class B, which would correlate with indefinite or low grade, we found that there was a change in the microsurface and, and or microvascular pattern without the presence of an irregular microvascular or microsurface pattern. And there was also the presence of a demarcation line, which you can see outlined here in these images. And in class C, there was either an irregular microvascular pattern uh, and or an irregular microsurface pattern, as well as the presence of a demarcation line. And here we can see the results in terms of uh, class A, the vast majority were non-dysplastic. Class B, 
Uh, about 69% were indefinite or low grade, 31% were non-dysplastic, and class C, all of which were high grade intramucosal or SM1. So the predicted pathology with these three categories, um, we can see the overall accuracy uh, was about 92%, again, based on the retrospective uh, validation with histology. Obviously, the limitations are that it's a pilot study, it was retrospectively analyzed, and we did not include any deeply invasive lesions, and we did not validate it in a prospective cohort as well as it being a single operator. To address a lot of these issues, we're currently preparing to start a um, second study. Uh, the phase one will be refinement of the previously developed classification, where we'll look at about 60 images with pathologic correlation uh, with magnification, and it'll be reviewed by five experts, um, and we'll finalize the uh, classification. Then we'll do an internal validation with another 60 images, and we'll look at the inter-observer and diagnostic accuracy uh, inter-observer agreement and diagnostic accuracy. And then finally, the external validation with uh, trainees will also look at the inter-observer and diagnostic accuracy. So our pilot study, I believe, uh, with three distinct classifications holds promise for an improved Barrett's classification reflecting non-dysplastic, indefinite or low-grade, and superficial neoplasia. And with our current study that we're uh, hopefully getting underway to start, we're gonna refine the classification and we'll add a fourth category specifically for massively invasive adenocarcinoma. And this will hopefully lay the groundwork for a prospective study examining real-time optical diagnosis with final pathology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, for this uh, outstanding presentation. And um, I would like to uh, start now to open up the discussion and I'm very happy that uh, Pradeep is also mm -hmm. uh, with us um, when you were not uh, in the net um, Carlos said you are the Pope of Barrett's and um, so let's start maybe uh, with the first question first um, Chris I want to congratulate you to your upcoming presentation it was a very balanced presentation and um, you showed wonderful examples of uh, EMR and also cases where we have to do an ESD and I think the conclusion is there are definitely cases where we see from the beginning when we start with EMR we will mess up the procedure and um, uh, patients uh, perspective in order to get an adequate uh, non-invasive treatment. So. Um, can you spend a few words uh, with regard to the future? There's still this discussion when EMR, when ESD, do we have enough studies already or do we need maybe new prospective trials deciding when to start with an ESD? Mm. Uh, yeah, thank you, Stefan. You're, this is a, a difficult, uh, challenging clinical dilemma, uh, which is why I thought it was important to talk about. I think we don't have enough data because the, the current data lumps too broad of population inclusions. So, you know, current studies often will also include patients with high-grade dysplasia. So you have patients with high-grade dysplasia or purely intramucosal cancer, and then you're comparing EMR and ESD, and then you end up seeing that there isn't a benefit from ESD because you're including patients who didn't need ESD. So I think we need to have studies that look specifically you know, at, at patients where there's more extensive, you know, clearly cancer, um, a visible cancer, um, where maybe prediction of SM or concern about possible SM invasion, like the most recent uh, Dutch study, I, I, you know, they really are very strict. They only included patients with sessile lesions or suspicion of semicrosal invasion. So I think if we had studies that looked at those kinds of patients, and we're able to compare ESD and EMR, then we'd really potentially see a strong benefit that would really play out. Um, I think from our perspective, when we see lesions that look like a very discrete cancer and say, okay, this is a real nodular tumor or a very impressive cancer, we always choose ESD. Uh, when there's, you know, we see the surface changes that are suggestive of intramucosal cancer, but we don't um, suspect there's some mucosal invasion or there's nothing morphologically that's going to suggest there's going to be a difficult recession, I would say still 90% of our resections are still EMR. And part of that is a volume perspective. We can't do the ESD for all the patients, uh, just from a resource perspective. We also have patients who come from three, four or five hours away. Um, and on their initial diagnostic assessment, we're quite willing to go straight ahead to do EMR. 
whereas there's more involved, you know, setting up a patient for ESD, and we're not going to just do that on their first encounter with the patient. So some of it, I think, is practical logistics. Some of it is resources in terms of time, um, and then the clinical decision making of, of what's best for the patient. So a uh, long answer, but basically, Stefan, I think we need more data uh, to to really focus on the patients that we think are actually going to have the clinical benefit, and then we can show that that benefit. Yes. I think the examples you have shown were excellent um, already, and I think um, the studies need to be done also. We compare different patients group, from my uh, opinion, and uh, as you said, I think in the future we have more and more complicated cases uh, where can we avoid uh, surgery. Maybe, uh, Pradeek, uh, what do you think about this? How is uh, the situation in the United States? I think we have now the situation that more and more endoscopists are able to perform ESD, and uh, I think it's a different situation than maybe five years ago. What do you think? Yeah, no, Stefan, uh, thanks. And again, uh, Haru and Stefan, thanks for having me on this. And Chris and Rob, uh, you know, great uh, talks and, uh, uh, you know, setting up the stage for this discussion. I, I agree with what uh, Chris, uh, you know, mentioned in his presentation uh, about the role. I mean, I think what had happened over the years is we were arguing whether a patient should have EMR versus ESD. So there uh, probably was an unnecessary debate. I think rather than a debate, we should have tried to figure out where do both of them fit in, right? I mean, it necessarily does not have to be one versus the other. It could be both depending as to which patient. So I think that's part of our problem is that we created this unnecessary debate and argument rather than we could have been studying, as Chris pointed out nicely, is which patient could have got EMR versus which patient could have got you know, ESD. So now I think we are lagging behind. We do need more data on ESD and figure out which patients require ESD and we need to refine those criteria rather than trying to argue which patient needs it or doesn't need it and then have a, a, a debate about that. So th that's, I think, where we would see this. So in the US, it's increasing. I hope we don't get into this rut that because it's available, you start doing it for every patient because then I think the data become muddy. So there is a difference in doing an ESD for a two millimeter lesion versus a four centimeter lesion, right? I mean, and so I think we need to try to separate those out. And my hope is just because we can do it doesn't mean we should start doing it. We need to define the patient population. And just like EMR plus ablation, we need to study ESD plus ablation and provide longer term data to show that it's effective in that group of patients. Thank you. I have now a question to Rob. Thank you also for your sure. outstanding presentation, especially for your research uh, project for the future. I have a question with regard to um, artificial intelligence. I think um, we are now in a time period where many new doctors, they went to Japan, like you. You have learned from the um, diagnostic abilities of our Japanese colleagues, and you bring this knowledge now to the Western world. Um, what do you think, which role may play artificial intelligence in such a classification? Because um, I think um, still when you talk about low-grade dysplasia, this is sometimes between nothing and a little bit. And uh, I don't know if we ever are able to really diagnose a low-grade dysplasia by uh, a diagnostic uh, endoscopic image. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the issue with low-grade dysplasia as well, I think it's not only quite variable in terms of what you see endoscopically, but if you take pathologists as well, um, in terms of expert GI pathologists, there, there's also not a great uh, inter-observer uh, reliability in terms of the diagnosis of low-grade dysplasia. So I think it's somewhat reflected as well in, in the classification. Um, and I think in, in terms of AI, I think the, the potential um, of it in, in conjunction with AI is to improve the input into the AI platforms. If we can, again, uh, input the data into the AI platforms that are constantly also learning um, in terms of, you know, uh, what is suspicious for low-grade dysplasia or indefinite, this may also be beneficial rather than just the, um, you know, 
carcinoma or something resectable. So it would be, you know, this is pretty confident that this is non-dysplastic. So you could argue down the line, it would be doesn't require biopsy versus something that is indefinite uh, or low grade, then would require uh, biopsy, something that is suspicious for high grade intramucosal, then it would just go straight to resection. Um, so inputting that kind of optical diagnosis data into an AI platform that again, continuously kind of improves, um, it, it may help uh, down the line when AI does become more widespread and kind of uh, in day-to-day -day practice for Barrett's uh, to maybe improve that um, uh, the, the use of it in terms of being more clinically applicable um, and potentially avoiding a lot of unnecessary biopsies where something you can say very, you know, with, with high confidence that is non-dysplastic, which I think the most of the classifications have shown quite well. Uh, but the area that most of them don't include is low grade. Some include low grade. But I think mm -hmm. having some of that data and being able to put it into or incorporate it into AI uh, will improve those platforms down the line. I think there's an extra session about AI, but I have a question to uh, Pradeek. We, um, we have your excellent uh, classification, CM classification, but then we have a lot of classifications with the Barrett's. How do we get out of this dilemma? Because I think um, what is important that uh, we should decide for one classification, because when you use a classification, I think you assess the uh, um, the Barrett's better than you if you wouldn't use a classification. But how to go out of this dilemma? What do you recommend? Uh, Stefan, an excellent uh, question. I wish I had the answer for it. So, uh, and, uh, you know, I enjoyed, uh, you know, Rob's uh, presentation and his excellent images, which you can see. Uh, you know, he learned from uh, Haru about, uh, you know, taking these beautiful pictures and seeing these different pit patterns with the Japanese are so good at. Uh, although I was disappointed that Rob did not like our classification and he's trying to invent a new one. So I'm a little bit disappointed in that. But no, that's uh, joking aside. You know, at the end, I think that uh, the reason we are coming up with new classification systems, I think, has more to do with the endoscopy platform. So I have to admit that, you know, I, uh, you know, along with uh, Ken Goda and uh, Waxman and stuff, we came up with the Bing classification because it was more NBI driven, right? So uh, that's what it was. Uh, then the Fuji uh, people came up with their Blink classification and then Rob showed the iScan classification. So I think at the end, if you go to in depth of all these classification systems, they're saying essentially the same thing which is look Absolutely. at the surface pit pattern and look at the vascular pattern. And I think if we keep that in mind, it doesn't matter whether we call it the Rob's queen classification or the Stefan classification. I think it all remains the same, which is you evaluate two things and you make up your mind. But Stefan, I completely agree with you. I, I think LGD cannot be diagnosed because even pathologists can't look at it. So we shouldn't waste our time trying to do that. We focus on two extreme ends, which is what's clinically relevant. Is it non-dysplastic? And then you don't take any biopsies and get away from the biopsies or maybe take one biopsy. Or is it high grade or cancer in which you need to do a resection, right? Uh, even for diagnosis or a diagnostic uh, EMR. So. To me, I mean, I think if we just keep it simple, do it, I think that will be key. But at the end also, you know, I mean, Haru has some excellent sessions in Tokyo Live about AI. Th these will be moot points. This will be replaced, whether we like it or not, with artificial intelligence. Just for the last 10 years, we've had virtual chromoendoscopy. For the next 10 years, we will have AI with the switch of a button with all these endoscope systems even if you don't want to buy AI, it will be in these endoscope systems. And so I, I think I see the transition, uh, you know, going in that direction. Thank you very much. Haru, do you have a comment? Yes, sure. Thank you very much. It's a, a great talk. So, uh, so Robert actually uh, talking about the, uh, how to uh, uh, identify the region and also characterize the region. So using the uh, um, uh, magnifying, ma sometimes magnification and the, uh, and also uh, uh, Teshima Sensei. So Chris uh, mentioned about the application of EMISD. So 
and the, I, I think like that. So um, as the uh, uh, practice mentioned that the uh, indication of a EML ESD is, uh, depends on the, but the particular easy thing is a lesion size. As a Pratik mentioned, the two millimeter, five millimeter, so such kind of lesion, of course, <laughs> EMR, that's all. So uh, for the four centimeter, we have a discussion, the uh, uh, unblock or piecemeal. So it uh, also depends on the infiltration depths. Uh, so it's a, a quite, quite a theoretical discussion. And the, um, in that, uh, so diagnostic process and also a treatment process. So most important, I think it's the same in the stomach and the uh, squamous esophagus, the barrett esophagus, I think it's all same. So uh, if we can identify the lateral margin of the region, uh, we can treat it. So, but um, we, uh, in the squamous esophagus, uh, it's a relatively easy to identify the margin of the region. So sometimes when I uh, visit the uh, uh, Toronto and the Zurich and the Kansas, so uh, I, I sometimes see, uh, uh, they have the opportunities uh, to see a long so suffering Barrett esophag esophagus patient. So in such a patient, so sometimes uh, extremely difficult to identify the border of the region. So uh, sometimes very unclear. So background mucosa is uh, some part is the intestinal metaplasia, some part is uh, another different morphological um, uh, uh, metaplasia. So a lot of uh, like, uh, um, so multiple, multiple, multiple uh, image. And then uh, so difficult to identify the margin. So once we can identify the lateral, lateral margin of the region, anyway, we can, we can do the uh, resection. So EML, ESD or some other. And the, uh, so um, I think uh, it's a, uh, Yes, quite interesting. So uh, I, I'm not a specialist of the Barrett esophagus, but so all your discussion is very, very uh, informative to me. And also uh, Pratik and uh, Lob mentioned that the AI diagnosis is uh, quite impressive. So I I saw uh, several so nice video demonstration of AI diagnosis of a Barrett's uh, high-grade dysplasia, so impressive. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, so um, I, I think so, uh, gradually, gradually, uh, this area also um, uh, improving, I think. So th th that's a comment. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Yes, um, thank you, Haru, for this uh, comment. And um, I think we are at the end of a very interesting uh, session. Thank you first to Chris and Robert for these outstanding presentations. Uh, it was really amazing. And uh, thank you, uh, Pratik, for your commentation and your comments. It uh, was always great uh, to see you. And thank you, Haro, for bringing us together in Endoscopy 1. And please also join the other sessions. Thank you very much. <laughs>